At this time, I will turn it over to our mistresses of ceremony, Ms. Kennedy Perry, who is the president of PC's chapter of NAACP, and Ms. Anaya Woodard, who so serves as the president of the Multicultural Student Union here at Presbyterian College. Um, so starting off, tonight we will have the introduction of the speaker by MSU Multicultural Student Union Chaplain and Sergeant Arms, Obed. Well, welcome everyone. My name is Dr. Booker T. Ingram, as was noted. It is very delightful to be here. I taught here for 34 years, beginning in August 1987 until my retirement July 1st. 2021. It was a, a great experience for me to be here uh, as a political scientist during some interesting times in American history. My wife and Florence, who is here with me this evening, we are delighted that you all came out to join us and we are very grateful for <coughs> Presbyterian College and College naming this particular lecture in my honor. Very appreciative of that. I've been asked to spend a few minutes to talk about Black History Month and why we celebrate it. Originally called Negro History Week, it was uh, created in 1926 when the great African-American historian, Dr. Carly G. Woodson, who was a longtime faculty member at Howard University and eventually became the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, as well as the Association of the Study of Negro Life and History, announced the second week of February to be Negro History Week. Dr. Woodson had long noted that African Americans' contribution to America's social and political development were overlooked, ignored, and even suppressed by the writers of history textbooks as well as the teachers who used them. He was determined to change the flawed narrative that traditionally defined America's history and that had intentionally left out the narrative of African Americans, women, and Native Americans in the building of the American democracy. So he and the Association of the Study of Life and Negro Life and History chose the second week in, in February to celebrate Negro History Week because it, can, it coincided with the birthdays of two of the greatest citizens and individuals that America has ever produced. Abraham Lincoln was born on February 12th, and the great abolitionist and also great civil rights leader, Frederick Douglass, was born on February 14th. These two birthdays have been celebrated in the black community beginning in the late 19th century. Early in the 20th century, Negro History Week eventually became Black History Month. And here we owe gratitude to the students and the faculty members at Kent State University in, in Ohio as they were the first to celebrate Black History Month in February 1969. We also know that six years later, Black History Month will become celebrate a celebration for the entire country when the then president, Gerald Ford, declared at the United States uh, Bicentennial in 1976, Black History Month, as a national day of observance. He urged Americans to seize the opportunity to honor the often neglected accomplishments of black Americans in every area of endeavor throughout our country. So like you, I look forward to this evening's program and the wisdom that our speaker will share with us as we honor the tradition that was so thoughtfully established by the great historian Carter G. Wilson in 1926. Please enjoy the program. Thank you very much. Antoine C. Wright is the founder and CEO of Blueprint Strategy, Strategy LLC, a public relations, 
advertising and political consulting firm based in South Carolina. He has led many extensive grassroots and strategic efforts for political clients at the national, state, and local level. He has advised campaigns for governors, U.S. Senate, U.S. Congress, state legislature, and other down-ballot races. He advised the 20, 2008 and 2016 presidential campaigns for Hillary Clinton. He has advised as the Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committee, South Carolina Democratic Party, Georgia State Democratic Party, New York State Democratic Party, and many others. He continues to serve as senior advisor to the Democratic Congr Congressional Campaign Committee, DCCC, and the Democratic National Committee, the DNC. He is also a senior visiting fellow at Third Way. Antoine is a 2008 graduate of Winthrop University, where he received a Bachelor of Science degree in Business Administration and Marketing, and a 2010 graduate of Webster University, where he received his Master's degree in Business Administration, MBA. So without further ado, I introduce to you Antoine Seawright. Good evening. Good evening. It is certainly an honor and a privilege for me uh, to be back at, on the campus of Presbyterian College. Uh, every year since 2000, and I think 16, I come here to kick off Girls Day, Family Girls Day. Uh, so it's certainly an honor to be here tonight. Let me start by saying what my mother and father taught me to be the two most important words in the English language. And they're not nearly said enough. And those words are thank you. Uh, thank you, first of all, to this wonderful buffet of students who showed up here tonight. Give yourselves a big round of applause just for being here. Uh, to my dear friend, and I do mean a friend, uh, Dr. Selena Blair, who is a treasure and a jewel, and I cannot thank you enough for how much she has poured into me, both personally and professionally. So, Dr. Selena, thank you so much for inviting me to be here. Uh, to my first love and the lady who gave birth to me. Uh, she rode in the car one hour and 18 minutes with me. Uh, scared as hell in the back seat because I was driving so fast. Uh, but my mother's here, please give her a hand. And to a young lady from Cleveland, Ohio, uh, who I met a few years ago on accident uh, as I was doing what I do for a living. Uh, and that accidental uh, meeting a few years ago as I turned into her grabbing my heart. Congresswoman Chantel Brown from Cleveland, Ohio. <laughs> and I see my dear friend and just a, a long time advocate Lewis, thank you for, for being here. I know there are two council, women's council, county council, and city council. Thank you all for your service. And certainly, uh, it is such an honor, Dr. Ingram, uh, to be here on this occasion, to stand in front of your name. Uh, you are a walking piece of black history, and we should never, ever forget your contribution to the state to this country and this community. Y'all please give it up for him. Now let me just confess for a second. I woke up this morning at 3.06 a.m. in Cleveland, Ohio. Got on a 6.05 a.m. flight to Charlotte, North Carolina. Got to Charlotte at about 7.45 a.m. Rented a car drove to an event that I had to speak at this morning. So let me confess, I'm tired. <laughs> but let me also confess, uh, see, I didn't want to bring Chantel to the College of Brown to this event. Because after the speech this morning, we got in the car. I thought I did a good job. The people were standing up clapping. Uh, Dr. Ingram, I thought I did well. So we get in the car, and she hands me uh, some rolled up money. I said, wow, I did that good. And I, Healed the money back, and I started looking at the amount of money. Well, I said, wow, I must do a damn good job. And she said, no, you're one of the poorest speakers I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> so uh, I just gave you some money to compensate. Um, but I'm glad to be here. 
I'm, I'm glad to be here. You know, I heard Dr. Ingram uh, regurgitate uh, black history, but one of the most proudest accomplishments in my professional career was in 2012 when I was working in the South Carolina General Assembly and with the legislature who, a legislator of the state senator gave me my first opportunity. We were able together to make February uh, Black History Month for the first time in our state's history in law in 2012. And so when I heard you reading all the things and the progress we made nationally, uh, we sometimes forget the progress we made here just in the state of South Carolina. And that's where I want to focus my attention here tonight. Is that all right? Yeah, yeah. Somebody said, that's all right, Antoine. That's all right. That's all right, Antoine. That's all right, Antoine. That's all right, Antoine. That's all right, Antoine. <laughs> when I travel around the country, uh, I get this one question. Nowadays, probably more than ever, especially around February. They ask the question, well, what is black history? What is black history? What is black history moment? And I always respond with the same response, Councilwoman. I say it's a collection of stories from our people, passed down generations to generations. What amazes me sometimes, and I'm guilty of this too, and I have been throughout my life, is that we spend so much time talking about those big names and those big things in history. And I confess, I've been guilty of that too. We hear the Harriet Tubbins, we hear the Rosa Parks, we hear the Frederick Douglasses, we hear the Martin Luther King Juniors, we hear all these big names in history. But the older I get, the more I realize it's so important that we pause and reflect on the history that's right in front of us. That's why, Dr. Ingram, I'm so proud to be here to see you. It's just a walking piece, a walking billboard for black history. So I challenge you this evening for a few minutes to take a short job through history with me right here in South Carolina. Somebody say right here in South Carolina. Somebody say right here in South Carolina. So let me tell y'all the truth. The more y'all talk to me back, the quicker we can get this over. Is that all right? Right here in South Carolina. So it's the stories like George Elmore, born in Holly Hill, South Carolina. 1905, who had the courage to imagine a world that looked beyond Pitchfork Bill Ben Tillman and the systemic segregation and the defranchisement of black voters right here in South Carolina. It's the story of how he found the strength to stand up against the closed, all-white, democratic primary system that prohibited black voters from participating in the all-white Democratic primary. Somebody say right here in South Carolina. Right here in South Carolina. And even though that meant risking everything he had and he had accumulated, he was willing to do it. He was a light-skinned man. My grandparents would probably call that fair-skinned. He had, and while he sometimes was confused for a white man, the clerk who took his voter registration that one day when he tried to vote finally had the audacity to ask him the question, are you white or are you black? And when he answered the question, he was simply denied the right to vote in the all-white Democratic primary. So Judge Elmore, this owner of a five and dime store, he owned a liquor store. He was a taxi cab driver right in Columbia, South Carolina. He had the audacity to file a lawsuit in 1947. That lawsuit was called Elmore versus Rice. Well, this famous judge, who I, I, I'm a pretend lawyer. I'm one of those Law and Order, Perry Mason, Matlock kind of lawyers. So I found myself studying traditional history in one regard, and I look up to great lawyers and judges who've been all around me. So this, one judge, Judge Wade is weary, decided to rule in, judge, in George Elmore's favor. And because of that one lawsuit in 1947, black people now have the opportunity to vote in the Democratic primary. And because of that one lawsuit, it opened up the floodgates all across the country 
for black voters to be able to participate in the Democratic primary. Somebody say right here in South Carolina. Right here in South Carolina. But it didn't come without cost because George Emma lost everything. Fast forward to take through history, his wife had, had what we call a nervous breakdown. Uh, she was admitted to a facility. He later died. They burned crosses in his front yard, shut down his business, could not leave his house. His wife died in 1950, he died in 1959. A broken man who had lost everything he'd accumulated in his life, all because he filed a lawsuit. But then six years before he died, he was able to live to hear about it because he did not die in full health. Lyndon B. Johnson signing the Voting Rights Act. That we should be clapping for. There's a story of a lady by the name of Sarah Mae Fleming who was thrown from a city bus in downtown Columbia, South Carolina. 17 months before Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat on the Montgomery bus. <clears throat> it's the story of Harry and Elijah Briggs, gas station attendant, domestic worker from Somerton, South Carolina, who filed a lawsuit against the Clarendon County School District. That lawsuit eventually became Brown versus Board of Education because the superintendent of that district refused to provide even one bus for black students who had to walk 18 miles to school to and from, right here in South Carolina. In 1946, a man by the name of Isaac Woodard, a black man, army sergeant, on his way home to South Carolina after serving in World War II, was pulled from a bus, Dr. Selena, arguing with the driver. The local police chief, right in Baseburg, Leesville, South Carolina, beat him, left him unconscious, took a billy club, and poked his eyes out. We're talking about somebody who just came from serving this country. Poked his eyes out. The incident made national news. Sadly, an all-white jury acquitted the police officer who beat and blinded this man. That little incident in Baseburg, Leesville, South Carolina led to Truman, President Harry Truman, desegregating the armed forces in this country. So as a result of one little incident in Baseburg, Leesville, South Carolina, black men and women, brown boys and girls can now join every branch of the military in this country. That's worth you all clapping for. Who would have thought that a cold, rainy picket line of tobacco workers in 1945 in Charleston, South Carolina would become the birthplace for that song that we sing so often during February called We Shall Overcome, right here in South Carolina? Who would have thought that a surprise 2008 win in the first in the South primary would start an irresistible wave of change and movement in this country that eventually led to the nation electing the first black president of these United States. That happened right here in South Carolina. And so when people ask me about black history, I tell them stories like these few stories I share with you. I also tell them that as I stand right here at Presbyterian College here on February 20th, 2023, I tell them that I'm the proud grandson of sharecroppers from rural South Carolina. And although my mother and father did not go to anybody's college, we made progress in my bloodline because they were better than my grandparents because, because now they could at least spell college. And although they did not go to college, I proudly heard you probably heard a young man say, I have two degrees from what I believe two of the best institutions in this country. That we all should be applauding and celebrating. <laughs> and so I want to anchor my remarks tonight on another real hyper-local story. 
that's somehow forgotten in history, but I think it's a powerful Dante group. There's a small town in South Carolina's upstate, not too far from here, called Lawrence, South Carolina. Who's heard of Lawrence, South Carolina? Somebody say Lawrence. Lawrence. With a population of around 9,000 residents, Lawrence is a pretty typical small southern town, quiet, rural, and unassuming. You might not notice the history of violence and hate sewn into the foundations of one of those abandoned buildings downtown Lawrence, South Carolina. You might not notice the sneer behind this crumbling facade. You might not see how the memory of blood behind these boarded up windows, but it's there. And even though the words are absent from the Echo Theater's marquee, dirty and blank after all these years, the story remains right there. And it's not so much the story that echoes past as a segregated movie theater, though that's there. It's about what happened after that. Somebody say right here in South Carolina. Right here in South Carolina. It's the story of a man, a man by the name of Michael Burke, Jr. And how he brought the theater and transformed it into the world famous redneck shop. Now you might be tempted to think that that's funny. You might be tempted to roll your eyes at the simplicity and ignore the thinking. There they go again and write Antoine Seawright's come off, comments off as silly. But please don't. In fact, I beg you don't. Because Michael Burton wasn't just some misguided young fools led astray by the years of rhetoric and revisionist history that tells working class white folks that their real enemy is other working class families because they don't share the same skin color or language or for that matter, God. Michael Burton was, wasn't just some unenlightened object of pity. He was the South Carolina Grand Dragon of the Ku Klux Klan, better known as the KKK. And that redneck shop wasn't some prank for boys who will be boys. It was the headquarters for two different Klan factions, the neo-Nazis and a national rally site for the Aryan Brotherhood. Somebody say right here in South Carolina. Right here in South Carolina. It was a focal point and a base point for all white supremacists activity in South Carolina and probably historians argue this in the Southeast. That wasn't a joke. I'm dead serious. At the same time there was another man by the name of Reverend David Kennedy, pastor of Lawrence New Beginning Missionary Baptist Church, community leader, NAACP activist, Kennedy had a history with the Klan. He grew up in a segregated housing development. His grandmother's uncle had been lynched by the Klan. His grandmother's uncle bought it home from a nearby railroad trestle in 1913. The rope remained in that same spot for 75 years. And when they opened the redneck shop, he went into action because he saw that redneck shop for what it was. And that's how it stood for a while. Kennedy would fight, and the Klan would fight back, sometimes violently, but he did not scare very easily. Come to think of it, Dr. Salina, he did not scare at all. But after a while, Michael Burton started to change. Burton was newly married, struggling financially, and he started to question the decisions that brought him to this point in his life. Somebody say right here in South Carolina. Right here in South Carolina. And eventually, Michael Burton decided to change. But no one who could help him wanted to because they saw him for what he was and who he was. So with no other choice, guess who Michael Burton turned to? Reverend David Kennedy. And just as a good, Christian, faithful, community man would do, Reverend Kennedy did not turn away. And even though he knew it would be dangerous, even though this man, Michael Burton, had once ordered 
to have him killed, he took him in his home, sheltered him, counseled him, supported him, helped him get his life back on track. He stood with him, in some cases stood between him and those who would do him harm. And even when members of Reverend Kennedy's own community called him crazy, his response was, I don't see him for what he was. I see him for the brother he is and the brother he can be. And all I see is a brother in Christ. So it comes out, Reverend David Kennedy did not scare so easily. So now when you drive down the streets of the big city of Lawrence, you see the Echo Theater still standing there, just short of the Cabinet Know that there's hate sown into the foundations. Know the sneer that lies just beneath the crumbling facade. Know the memory of the blood behind the boarded up windows of what used to be the world famous redneck shop. But also know this, the name on that deed for that building is not Michael Burton anymore. It's Reverend David Kennedy. It was sold to him by Michael Burton, the man who Change his life. Now, some of y'all are looking at me like, why is this 37 year old black boy coming here tonight tell me, telling me these stories? Well, I'll tell you why. As I travel around this country now, and I work for CBS as a commentator, there's a conversation going on in this country, something called CRT, Critical Race Theory something that I have no idea what it really is. And so when people ask me about CRT, here's my response, Dr. Ingram. I say, we have a critical race problem in this country, and that ain't no damn theory. <laughs> I also tell them, I know my family's history, and I know the history of this country, and I know the history of right here in South Carolina, and I will go to my grave before I let a few people with an agenda try to whitewash or diminish the contributions that black people have made to this country and to the state and to our community. <laughs> and so I tell you these stories, and I tell you the story of Reverend Kennedy. Most of you probably did not know it, it's right here in your own community. But the story of Reverend Kennedy is about and Michael Byrd is about one thing. It's about being able to step outside of your comfort zones. And that's all black history is. Those of us who look like me, those of us who are the African seed and the American son and daughter, being pushed outside of our comfort zone. And those who did not look like us, having to be in a very uncomfortable place to get to a new comfort zone. And I'll share the story and I'll take questions from you. When I talk about comfort zones, I can't help but think of the story of a guy by the name of Thomas Edison. And most of you, like I was when I was younger, I gave Thomas Edison credit for the light bulb. Who believed Thomas Edison created the light bulb, created light? Raise your hand, it's okay. And I was fooled all my life that we should give Thomas Edison credit for the light bulb. But if you do a little history, and you step outside of your comfort zone of what you're taught, you'll know something about Thomas Edison and the light bulb. And while Thomas Edison gets a lot of credit for the light bulb, and we're taught that in our schools, there was a time period in which Thomas Edison could not get that light bulb to work. He tried over and over and over again, but he could not get it to work, Dr. Ingram. So he had to step outside of his comfort zone. Thomas Edison had to step outside his comfort zone. Born in Ohio, moved to New Jersey. He had to go from New Jersey to right near Boston, Massachusetts and go find a man who was the son of slaves by the name of Louis Latimer. And if you don't know your history, Louis Latimer was a black man and Louis Latimer was responsible for creating the filament because the light bulb did not work without the filament. And so because Thomas Edison stepped outside his comfort zone, and because Louis Latimer stepped outside his comfort zone, 
When they decided to come together and create this new comfort zone, they eventually lit up the world. So we're standing in a building right now because a white man, Thomas Edison, born in Ohio, moved to New Jersey. A black man, Louis Latimer, New Jersey. Visit, a visit from a white man to Boston, Massachusetts. Create the filament. They put their creations together and lit up the world. So if you wonder why I told you the story of David Kennedy, it's because my challenge to you all as students who have to live in a world that doesn't look like your parents and your grandparents. The country's getting browner. A lot of people can't accept that. The country's getting flatter. A lot of people can't accept that. This little 200 plus year experiment called America is changing by the second. And it's gonna change again next year this time. But my challenge to you all, including those who may not be students anymore, is don't be afraid to step outside of your comfort zone. Because you never know your step outside of your comfort zone can be the one thing that could eventually change this world. Thank you so much.
Yes, ma'am. Well, we've got to respond with truth. We've got to respond with truth. And the truth can't always come from me. It can't always. When people want to whitewash history and diminish the contribution that black people made to the country, I tell anybody, black history is American history. And you cannot have American history without black history. And so it takes people who look like you, the people who certain people think want this to happen for the sake of their children's future and they want to minimize certain aspects of history, it takes people like you to stand up and tell the truth. And I'm not you, but you. And then the other piece of that is, in this country, in the words of one of my mentors and friends, uh, Congressman Benny Thompson of Mississippi, we set our differences and our disputes at the ballot box. And the way we boot, beat back on this, book, on this foolishness, sorry, uh, that we see, called critical race theory, is by beating these people at the ballot box. If we beat them there and show people what we want this country to look like, we'll make progress. And, and that don't mean Democrat or Republican. That's just right versus wrong. I mean, think about this. I want you to think about this. I want everybody to think about this for a second. Just last week, in the South Carolina General Assembly, there was legislation passed that a parent can now sue a school district or a school if they believe that what's taught in the classroom is racist. I can guarantee on TV that wasn't pushed by the black people. <laughs> because we'd have all sorts of generations. <laughs> but literally, that's the kind of rhetoric and discussions are going on all around this country. So how do you defeat that? You defeat that in the battle. You defeat that with your voice. We've made change and progress in this country. The reason I can go to the same bathroom as you is because we made progress at the battle box. The reason black kids can go to white schools and white schools can go, white kids can go to black schools is because we made change in the battle box. And that's how we have to constantly keep making change. And look around this room. It was my mother's generation where a room like this would not even be possible. And if you're like me, most of y'all students, you probably take it for granted. And you like, oh, I got my white friends, I got my brown friends, I got this friend, I got that friend. But we're one generation away from what, when this wasn't even a reality. And so that's why y'all have an obligation to fight like hell to make sure we keep making progress and we don't roll the clock back, because it's so easy to do. Don't be shy. I'll answer anything. <laughs> yes. You are brave, so sad. <laughs> I do. You know why I want you to stand up? Because you, you are strength for your peers who are scared to ask a question. And I want them to celebrate you with a clap. <laughs> because you were just a bold black woman who decided to stand up and wanted to make change. Well, I appreciate you saying that. I try to be a, uh, I, I try to be a consumer of history. Um, and in 1905, George Santiago's, a great scholar, wrote, if we do not learn from history, we're bound to repeat history. Good or the bad. You said it so right. 
when you said we've already seen it, we've already seen it, the tides roll back. And that's because people, people who want progress to roll back have gotten smarter. They've become more sophisticated in their fight. And people who fought for change and progress hadn't always kept up at the same pace. And so you take three steps forward, you take five steps backwards. In my mother's generation, there was something, in my grandparents' generation, uh, they had what they call a poll tax. Had to be able to pay the vote. Well, just a couple of years ago, I was on a plane. It was 2016. No, it was post 2016. So on a plane down in Florida, raising hell. You know why? Because the current governor of Florida, and I ain't playing politics, I'm just telling you the truth. The current governor of Florida, who's the governor there, implemented an executive order and passed the legislature, uh, signed into law that if someone served their time and they wanted to register to vote again, they had to pay a fee. My grandparents' days, they would call that a poll tax. He just called it a restitution. It's not right. After the 2008 election that I mentioned in my remarks, when we, we elected our nation's first black president, across the South, across the South, let me go back and Google this, we saw voter, voter suppression legislation pop up in 11 states, something called voter ID. When the Supreme Court ruled on voter ID, they specifically said the impact on legislation like this will severely <coughs> impact black people, brown people, seniors, and young people. The four, I call them consumer food groups who've always been on the front line of change in this country. That did not happen by accident. After the 2020 election, when young people, black people, brown people, and women showed up in record numbers to elect the current president and vice president. Starting in the South, it has filtered out to 48 states, 368 plus pieces of legislation to further suffocate and suppress the votes. Every analysis I've read, even my Republican friends tell me, Antoine, this is not by accident. It's because y'all voted in record numbers in the 2020 election. So now, in the state of Georgia, they had lines around the corner. People waiting in line three hours to vote. It's illegal to give somebody a bottle of water or food in line. Well, the long line in Georgia, I can tell you because I work in Georgia, the long lines, guess what communities those lines are in? Communities look like mine. In Texas, Harris County, one of the blackest and brownest counties in Texas. The governor, who wants to be president, decided that instead of having multiple drop-off locations where you can go and put your absentee ballot, it's now one place for everybody in the whole county of Harris County. One of Harris County is almost like bigger than the state of South Carolina. One place where we drop off, where you can drop your ballot off. That means people from this side of town got to drive all the way to this side of town where transportation is issued and everything else just to be able to cast their vote. You talk about rolling back. I can give you multiple examples of how so easily, quietly, and sophisticated folks have gone or gotten to in order to roll back the progress we made in this country. Now, I, I may be naive, I may be young, I don't know, but I don't think there's anything wrong with having a lot of people participate and decide who would lead this country. If your message is as good as you say, if you got the good, if, if your food is as good as you advertise it, then you should not put limitations on who can try to eat it. That's the way I see it, and that's how I see government. 
We should be expanding those opportunities, not closing the window. And so that's why y'all have to fight like hell, even while you're a student. You have to fight like hell to make sure that you make progress. And don't, and don't, don't live to accept the status quo. Part of the reason I got in politics, I'll tell the story, I'll try to get to the next question. Part of the reason I got in politics, when I was a student at Winthrop, there's one professor, I won't call his name, it ain't even worth it. Um, but he had a book that he made everyone buy for class. This book was $327.14. Don't ask me how I know, but I know. And so if you didn't have his book the first day of class, then traditionally you were going to fail his class. Period. Antoine Seawright, never been one of those people to color inside the lines. Uh, so I decided to show up without that book. He looked me in my face and said, you can leave now because you're not going to pass my class. I stayed in my seat. My tuition paid for me to be there. I stayed in my seat. So, okay. So that night, and the, the problem went isolated to me, that night I got together with some friends. We went to Walmart. We bought some of those $14.99 bullhorns. And we raised hell on campus. And we went to the president's house. We, we, we were just radical, just, just crazy. And we had a unique coalition of people. We raised hell to the point to where I can tell you this. That professor is no longer at the university. And number two, no professor is allowed to require you to have a book. And that requirement determines whether you pass or fail a class. And so progress is sometimes small. But small progress, inch by inch, bit by bit, is how we make progress in this country. And you have to make progress right where you're at, right here on this campus. Because I'm sure you can look around in the community where you live, and somebody can say, well, you know what? Something ain't right. But if something ain't right, then somebody's got to fix it. And so don't let the somebody not be you, period. Spring Valley High School in Columbia. I said to her, I'm not buying you a big gift. I'm not giving you money. I'm not sending you on a big trip like some of your friends. I said to her, the one thing I am going to do is I'm going to commit me and my friends to making sure this world's a little bit better for you than it has been for us, your parents, your grandparents and other generations. You ask me what keeps me going. Knowing that my mother had to work two jobs most of my life, forget about trying to make ends meet, putting two ends together, hoping they meet my mother and my father. Knowing that my grandparents had to pick cotton, was told that they better do this, they better do that, had to clean houses, raise children on their own, fight like hell for survival, knowing those things about, about me and my family and my history. That is what keeps me going. Because if I leave this world, whenever my clock ticks out, and it will tick out, if the world's not a better place, or if one person doesn't breathe easy because I live, then I fail. And so I'm going to spend the rest of my life. It's part of the reason why I came here, Selena. I love you, but I'm tired. Um, but I'm going to spend the rest of my life fighting like hell uh, to make sure that my remaining nieces and nephews have a better world. Chantel's nieces and nephews. 
your children and grandchildren, all of you. I'm going to spend the rest of my life fighting like it. That's what keeps me going. And guess what? Nobody may not remember my name. They may not call my name. It may not be listed somewhere, but that's the black story. There's so many contributions with so many people that history will never remember them. But because of them, we are better as a country and as a people. So that's what keeps me going. The fight for better. The fight for better. Yeah. And coming here tonight, I, I walked in this building and I immediately went to the restroom and I had to gather myself. Um, and I buried my niece, 21 years old, a few, months, a few weeks ago. She was a student at Benedict College in Columbia. And I thought about her most of the way up here. Because somehow or another there would have been a black history program at Benedict College that she would have been sitting in. And she would have been listening to somebody, whether it was me or somebody else. And I say that to say, don't take the space you have and the time you have right now for granted. You know, people, when my niece was killed, people said, oh, well, how did she die? And I said at the funeral when I spoke, I said, forget about how she died. Remind of how she lived. And you all have to live your life to the fullest every single day. I guarantee you when she woke up that morning, she didn't know a simple car ride to get her father a birthday gift was going to be her last car ride. I didn't know it. That's her uncle. And so you just never know how things happen. You never know how life is going to play itself out. So while you have time, make all the progress, make all the change, do everything you have to do today. Because nothing is promised. Absolutely nothing is promised. Just know that. Just know that. Thank you. Thank you so much again for speaking tonight. Let's give him another round of applause. <laughs> Presbyterian College believes in the inherent dignity and self-worth of every individual and strives to be a welcoming, nurturing, and empowering campus for all. With the growing amount of students from various different racial, socioeconomic backgrounds, countries of origin, religious affiliations, gender identities, sexual orientation, and disability statuses, now more than ever, we must do our part to ensure just, equitable, and inclusive campus community. As a result, we ask you to stand with us tonight during our PC community as you enter Edmond Hall, all should have received a candle. The switch is on the bottom. If you will follow me and turn it on. I light this candle to illuminate the national theme of Black History Month, Black Resistance, and an outward expression of my commitment to advocate for a dignified, self-determined life in a just, democratic society. I light this candle in honor of the countless sacrifices made by individuals to ensure that all humans had access to civil rights and fair treatment, regardless of race, nationality, sexual orientation, gender identity, or disability status. Their lives and leg legacies shall never be forgotten. I light this candle in the memory of those whose lives were cut short due to police brutality. I light this candle as a reflection on the lives taken by senseless campus, campus shootings and the resiliency abounding in the aftermath. I light this candle exhibiting the resounding strength of the PC communities and the Howard Brew Hall's pride. signaling my personal commitment to challenge inequities and the personification of our motto, while we live, we serve.
Father, we want to thank you for this day. We want to thank you for life, love, and strength. And Lord, we just want to thank you, Father, for giving us this day, Father, and giving us this time, Father, to be able to reflect, Father, to come and learn uh, new things, Father, to understand, Father, what black history is. Father, we appreciate you, Father, for this time. Lord, we thank you, Father, for allowing us, Father, to be able to have our health and strength. Lord, we just want to thank you, Father, for allowing us, Father, to be in our right minds. Lord, we just honor you and we praise you and we thank you for today. Now, Lord, I, I have two things I want to bring to you on today. Father, the first is unity. Father, Lord, I ask that you help us, Father, to be united, Father, in all areas of our lives, Father, in every aspect, Father, in every intricate uh, place, Father, Lord, we thank you, Father, that you help us to be united. Father, we, we have, I've come to realize, Father, that this world is, is much more divided, Father, than united, and Lord, we need you, Father, you are the only one who can unite us. Father, I've learned, Father, that a house divided against itself cannot stand. So, Lord, I ask, Father, that you help unite us, Father, only the way that you can. Father, I thank you, Father, that you help us to love one another. Father, help us not to love one another, Father, unconditionally. But, Lord, help us to love unconditionally. Lord, help us, Father, to understand, Father, that love is what it does, Father. Help us to understand, Father, that we must love, Father, in spite of ourselves, in spite of our own agendas, in spite of everything that we could even think about, Father. Lord, we need you now, Father. Help us, Father, to understand, Father, that we have to remove ourselves, Father, when it comes to love. Help us to understand, Father, that we must, Father, we must love, Father, as you love us. Lord, we know that you can do it, for you hold all power in your hand. And so, Lord, I just thank you, and I bless you. I honor and I adore you. Now, Lord, I, 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 this topic, Father, has oftentimes gotten under my skin. But, Lord, um, the injustices, Father, that we have faced, Father, not just as black people, but, Father, as, as the world, Father, these injustices that we have faced, Father, Lord, they, they tend, Father, to cause us to feel some type of way. Father, they cause us to get angry. They cause us, Father, to feel depressed, to feel unwanted, Father, to feel like we don't belong, Father, in this world. But, Lord, I know, and I believe, Father, that you've given each and every one of us a purpose. And, Lord, uh, the names like uh, um, Brianna Taylor, Father, Lord, we, we don't know why, why you allow those things to happen. But, Lord, I do understand, Father, that you do have a plan. So, Lord, help us, Father, to see you, Father. Help us to see you, Father, not as we see situations. Lord, help us to understand, Father, that you do have a purpose. But, Lord, we, I just want to ask, Father, that you uh, tear down, Father, everything that is not like you, Father, Father, operating in the shadows. In the name of Jesus. Lord, I ask, Father, that you continue, Father, to, to do what you, only you can do, Father. Father, I thank you that you make, Father, the crooked places straight, Father. Not just in, in this place, Father, but in every schoolhouse, in every church, Father, in every workplace, Father, in every building, Father. Right now, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I thank you and I praise you. I honor and I adore you, Father, because I know that you can and I know that you will. And, Father, Lord, for those of us, Father, who feel like there has to be something done, Father, that we have to get our payback, Lord, I understand that you said that vengeance is yours. So, Lord, I ask, Father, that you do what only you can do. Lord, we need you now. And, Lord, we just thank you, Father, because you can do it. And, Father, Lord, I'm rejoicing in it now. But, Father, I'm expecting Father, to, to see what I am praying here today, Father. Um, be, come forth, Father. I'm expecting it now. Father, I'm expecting to see a change. Father, I have faith. For faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So, Lord, I believe you. I'm trusting in your word. And, Lord, if there's anything that I've forgotten, Father, I know, Father, that you will get it done. So, Lord, I just bless you and I thank you. And I give you all the honor, the glory, and the praise. It was in Jesus' name I pray, and I thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen.